Hello everybody and welcome to my channel, Art My Way. Um, as in, this is art your way, you tell me the way you want your art classes to go. Today's video is a beginning watercolors. What do you need? What is all this stuff? And where uh, do I need to get all this stuff at? Well, the thing is with watercolors, I used to hate watercolor. I thought it was stupid, the paint would never do what I wanted it to do, and it just it was just a horrible mess. Then I reached high school, and up until then, I'd always gotten watercolors that came in those little plastic shallow things, the Crayola watercolors. Uh, those were the only watercolors I had played with, and at the time I thought, that's the way all watercolors are. There's no fun in it whatsoever. Until my art teacher gave me this actual specific brand, I actually, this is a new one, this isn't the exact set of cakes, um, of watercolors. And then all of a sudden, I found out there is a humongous difference between cheap paints, medium range paints, and high uh, art performing paints. A humongous, humongous difference. And there is also a humongous difference between the flimsy paper that you use, that a lot of people get uh, 140 pound paper or less. That's what's really easily available out there. Uh, and then there's a big difference between this cardstock looking guy, which is 400 pound press paper. This guy is literally just like cardstock. He is thick. And see if I can't get the camera to take a look at these guys to show you the difference in thickness between these two papers. Yeah, it wants to focus on everything in the background. But you can kind of tell the difference there between these two. I mean, these guys, there's a monstrous amount of difference. There is a difference of probably about three, three and a half of this guy and this guy. Now what the difference might be, um, one of the differences is, believe it or not, the colors will lay down completely different over these two pieces of paper. So just keep that in mind that if you're not liking how your colors look, one, maybe try your colors, get a little test sheet, try your colors out on different thicknesses of paper. Now the way the paper comes, you'll see a, a, a size on it and then you'll see an actual poundage. Look for the actual pound, LB, to say whether or not if it is 400 pound press, because otherwise this 130 pound, or 140 pound press, uh, depending on what packaging and what company you buy it from, it could say that it is also 300 measurement. I don't remember what that measurement is. I've been trying to look at all my stuff to try to find out. and. Again, Limdool has run off with all of my watercolor paper that is actually in a package. Um, so definitely look for anything. The LB, that'll tell you. Now there's also cold press and hot press watercolor paper. Play with that too. Find out which one you like the most. I do cold pound press, uh, 300 cold pound press. I haven't played with 500 or with the hot, the hot press stuff. Um, but one of these days, once I get through all my cold pound, eh, maybe I'll buy a sheet and have some fun with that too and see what the difference is. But as of right now, for getting started, you definitely need to know that there, the pound pressure of the paper you use plus cold or hot press does make a difference in what, what you end up with, how the paint reacts. It does make a big difference. And if you're not liking something, it could either be your paints or super, super Crayola cheap paints. And I'm not knocking Crayola. They're great for getting kids interested in art. They're awesome for that. But unfortunately, sometimes like myself, I was extremely interested in art, a little bit too much for probably my age. And I just did not like the results that I ever got with this stuff. So I was like, watercolor. So, I'm not going to be mentioning any brands in my video, um, but I will be mentioning this brand 
Reeves. This is what got me started. This is not a super duper high end paint. Actually, one of the uh, the big two uh, painting companies. I'm not going to mention names. One of them makes this. Um, it is a nice and medium range paint. I like cakes. Now you will find the big the big uh, plastic bin of extra paint when I run out. You will find that paint comes in either cakes like this, which would be like what we see um, Crayola paints come out as. They're great. I personally like being in complete control of the amount of moisture that always goes into my watercolors whenever I am working. Which is really silly. I'm kind of tedious that way, but that's the way I like it. Um, your watercolors also come in these wonderful little tubes, and these tubes can come in so many different varieties. Um, you wouldn't have a clue what this was unless you saw the box on it. I just decided to take everything out of the box, put it in one place where I could find it, and make it all nice and easy on myself. So it can come like that. It can also come like this brand, longer plastic tubes. So there's all kinds of variety, and then you got even smaller, tinier tubes. It seems like the higher the amount goes up, the smaller the tube gets. Which, I mean, it makes sense to a point. Um, well, I do love this guy. I know how my colors are going to react. I know what my colors always end up looking like because this is the brand that I have stuck with for a very, very long time. And I have found over the years that there are other brands that I'm willing to play with. I, I may not, while I have this brand here, I go through my blacks a lot. And if you ever go and look at my watercolors on my website or on Facebook or the myriad of places where I have my stuff posted, Etsy and uh, Imager, yeah, try to find me. It's easy. Um, where was I? I don't remember. Ah. Well, I do know how all of these colors go. I do use my black tons. Now, I have found that I'm not going to buy this whole whole thing all over again just for one little cake of black. And unfortunately, they don't sell the cakes separately. Wouldn't that be awesome? But I have found that I can take my tubes and out of all of these brands that I have played with, there are a few that, yeah, okay, the black's comparable. The black doesn't change. Uh, their version of black doesn't change things very much from what I'm used to. It reacts with my paints the way I like it to react with my paints. So I will take the tube, I will squirt all the black out, well maybe not all of it, until I fill up my little tray here. And then I will let it dry out overnight. And then I got a cake. It's awesome. Love watercolors for, for their versatility. So that is how that goes. As you can see, I use my tray to do a lot of mixing. I also do very, very huge paintings. Um, the reason I tend to use my tray, one, it's there, it's easy, I don't have to dirty anything else up. And if I have leftover paint from something, I can just leave it in the top there where it doesn't, you can see that this beautiful Bahama blue, that's not what it's actually called, but that's what it always makes me think of, Bahama waters. You can see that blue is nowhere in my actual tray. So I'll leave him there. There are plenty of other projects I've ended up using him on. Uh, there's a rooster painting I've used him on. There's a Native American painting I've used him on. Tons and tons of stuff. You never know uh, where he's going to end up popping up at. Um, and because I like to work very, very detailed, I like to work uh, bit by bit when it comes to watercolors because I have all my drawing completely mapped out the way I do my watercolors. Um, I find that the smaller trays to be mixing things always works out a little bit better for me. And really when you start playing with watercolors, if you have that great big mixing tray that you see sometimes in the stores, um, it, it's, it's just too much. <laughs> you don't need all that all the time. At least that I've found. <clears throat> now you'll also see that there is no white in here either, a little nugget in there. Uh, that is because I actually use acrylic white for a lot of my uh, my pieces if I need it, if there's just a little area that needs a little touching up 
or I'm trying to get a specific shine in the eye and I want it to be even whiter than the page itself. Um, because that's what all watercolor is, is basically you are this, the page white is the white of your picture. Um, and then laying down the rest of the paint, that is, this is all your highlights, that's everything else. And sometimes this white just isn't enough. So to get a little, to show more light in specific areas, I will use an acrylic white. The reason for that is this guy will dry white. The white in here, once you add just a little bit of water to it to make it flow, whether it be watercolors or not, um, it's a lot more transparent, no matter how you work it, and it ends up either it, it never ever ends up being the bright brilliant white that you may need for a specific tiny area so I, I don't really mess with the whites I, it's a bit silly I'm sure there's plenty of actual artists out there watching this and listening to this who could give me better tips on when I might actually want to use this I really don't see it but that's just me there are lots of I like I love the colors I end up getting I don't really like to mix it in with a lot of other colors it's just to get those little brilliant areas of sparkle and white and to create a little bit more of a layered look which is something you don't typically get with watercolors now to the next part your brushes for watercolor you can't find me an oldie but a goodie in here I got so many paint brushes. Ah, you're, you are what I want. Come here, come here, come here, come here. All right. Now, when you look at this brush, you can see that he's very, very coarse. He's got very thick hair. He's very stiff. You can hear it. I don't know if you can hear it over there in YouTube land, but this is a very, very, this is almost like horse hair kind of hair on this guy. Um, this is traditionally more of an oil paint brush. You'll see them in the stores. Um, typically, I would avoid these guys for a lot of reasons. One, you can see all the colors and these all these bristles here. Um, you're going to get a lot of that with the watercolor. You're never going to be able to get him 100% clean. Uh, they do shed. A lot of brushes shed. I mean, that, that, that's, there's no getting away from that. But if you see a paintbrush bristle in a watercolor, it's a lot more detrimental than if you see a paintbrush bristle in an oil. Um, and especially the kind of textures you end up getting when you're painting, you'll get very thick. It will look like you painted with a horse's tail, if you've ever seen how a horse's tail is. And normally watercolors are traditionally a lot smoother. They flow better. They flow easier together and everything's nice and smooth and beautiful. Everything blends oh so well. It's going to be a little harder to get that with this kind of a brush. So traditionally these are your oils or your very, if you're using really thick acrylics or even um, mixed media, that's more what this guy is for. So you see this guy in the store and you're wanting to start watercolors. Um, I wouldn't just to get started just don't worry about that guy in you go now for the next ones to talk about Oop, give me here all right now you have a natural hairbrush I uh, believe this guy's a sable it's been a long time since I bought any brushes I take very good care of them how you take care of your brushes shows how long they're gonna last these guys could last you practically your whole lifetime just about and that is uh, through just, just playing and having fun and a little hobby type thing as if you were a professional artist uh, over using these guys multiple times a day yeah they're not gonna last as long because they're gonna get used a lot more but my brushes I have yet to really throw one away I find that by the time it gets to the point where it's not doing its job anymore you know what, I need a new liner brush, I need a new detail brush, a snip, 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 and I'll have it down to like just two or three hairs out of the overall brush, and yay, I got a, I got a fine detail brush now. But as far as these guys go, this guy used to be a white brush, let me see, nice brilliant white, like this guy would be, 
or is. I haven't played with him too much yet. I like my bigger fan brush. Um, but that's the way this other guy looks. <laughs> Sorry about that. My dog decided to tell the mailman what's what. So the thing to know with these two brushes is that you have your natural fiber or your natural hair brushes, your sables and different things like that, camel hair, um, and you have your uh, synthetics, and I don't know what all the synthetics are made out of, but they're just traditionally called synthetics. Uh, I like personally using synthetics the most when doing watercolors, mostly because they seem to go back to their original colors a lot easier over time uh, while your sables and stuff if you've ever seen those commercials where they show you what hair really looks like up close your own personal hair and uh, all the split ends and whatnot well you're going to get a lot of the same thing going on way down to a microscopic level of what these natural hairs they're going to be the same they're going to have little little lifts little you know like little areas where it's like almost looks like skin flakes coming up where a lot of the your paint can end up hiding in. It's not major and it's nothing really too detrimental. But I personally, when it comes to my watercolors, I prefer to go with the synthetics. And if you want to go with the natural stuff, then go for it. It is also very fine and very soft uh, and wonderful to play with and work around with. And also just fun to kind of just sit here and pet for a while. Uh, so and you guys get and now for the next important thing in the watercolor colorist toolkit this guy again if you watch my jewelry video you also know this guy is extremely important in jewelry smithing as well um, your 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 masking tape it's a wonderful wonderful thing and what you basically are going to be wanting to do with this, you're going to be wanting to get some sort of board. Now, I have two different boards. I have the kind of art board that a lot of people traditionally think of. You know, this great big guy, and it has clips going down one side. And, you know, he's got a handle, and he's pretty, pretty great overall. Um... He does not absorb water. He's nice, nice, hard, stiff board. You can lay him down anywhere that you want to be working on. Yeah, nice big guy. Only thing is, for me, and considering the size that I would prefer to paint, pick up the camera here. In the uh, scale that I tend to like to paint, this guy is very, very often never big enough for me. So what I also do when I this is my for my small work, I also get a little uh well it's not little by any stretch of imagination. I get a foam core board that is the biggest size that I can find. And oftentimes even he's not big enough, there might be some bits that hang over the edges. And I will tape, like you are seeing in here, I will tape my paper to him because he's bigger, he's portable. You don't want to be taping your artwork down to your countertops, mostly because you cannot move it after you've, well you can, but um, you're not, it's, it's just a big pain in the butt to untape it, go put it up, and then you, you do whatever you need to do for dinner on your, on your dining table or your actual table. And then you bring him back out, and you paint him, and you tape him down again. You know, that just takes away from your painting time. So having one of these guys that's portable, pick it up, put it back in your room, put it under the bed, you're ready to work on it again, you pull it out, set it down, get going. It's awesome. So, just to show you getting started here on this little bit of scrap paper, all you do... And trust me, you are always going to want to tape these guys down. And there are multiple ways to go about preparing your paper. Some people will take their paper and completely submerge it in water. Wipe it off with a sponge. You want to get it nice and wet. And then they'll let it expand for a little bit. 
and then they will either tape it down. I've even seen people staple it down. Now, I don't know what they're using as a board when they staple it, but the idea is that if you've ever played around with watercolors before, the paper gets all warped and, you know, looks nasty and it's all just floaty and movie like, like typically what you see in little kids when they're playing with watercolors. This process eliminates that. By getting it pre-wetted, it's already going to ex have expanded. It's already going to have moved. Uh, you give the t water enough time to seep into the paper. And uh, it's already done everything that it wants to do. And you don't want this sopping wet. You don't want to wait for it like a sponge to be completely expanded and everything. You just want to get it wet. Um, and then, once you've done that, you tape the sucker down. Now, I like to make sure that the tape is probably halfway over and halfway on the board or whatever it is I'm taping to. And then you just go around and you tape all the edges down. And you have to make sure all of them are taped down. So I didn't get this guy long enough. And another thing to keep in mind, which is really awesome with this method is now that you have all this paper that is being kept clean and perfect uh, your watercolors are not going to soak underneath it and bleed underneath this and uh, that leaves you a nice little border so that way if you decide this is good enough to have framed well you got a great little border there that the uh, framers can work with to make sure that all your artwork shows the way it's supposed to which just makes their lives easier. It makes your life easier in the long run overall. Now you might be wondering why I already, if I need to wet my paper before I do this, why do I already have this paper over here who is clearly dry and he's been here for quite some time. Why I already have him taped down? Well, that's because I taught myself how to watercolor paint. I have a completely different method for watercolor painting than probably your traditional watercolor artist will have. Brody, no. Sorry about that. Um, I do have a, a couple of little methods that over time, I have figured out how actual watercolor artists work. Uh, I tend to use a dry method of watercolor. I like to put wet to dry, and there's just enough water in my watercolors to move it around. Typically, it's dry by the time I get done with an area, or like, for instance, if I do this whole area over here, by the time I get up here, this area down here is already dry. And if I don't like something, then I will re-wet the area in small doses to move the pigments around. Because that's what watercolor is. It's just a bunch of little colored, like, sand, if you want to think about it. Very, very fine, tiny sand. But you'll find that you can re-wet an area and move your colors and your pigments around a little bit. And you can actually see, if you're really looking close, you can actually see it lifting and shifting over as you're using your brush to move it. So that is why that is there and why I'm not even going to bother to wet this because that's the way I like to do watercolors. Um, and by going ahead and taping it down and everything like I already have, and because I don't get my paper super, super wet or just wet traditionally how water, it's, watercolor artists don't get their paper super wet, but uh, my paper, it will buckle and it will wave a little bit, but then by the time it dries, it dries back nice and flat the way I like it to be. So it works out pretty great. Either way, whichever way you decide you want to do it, but no matter what way you decide to do it, be it the traditional way or a really dry method, you got to tape it down. That way it just makes everybody way happier in the end and makes you happier in the end with your final product. Let's see here, anything else? Oh, one more thing to mention. Um, if you are taking an in a real world class for watercolors or any kind of painting, um, 
having worked in an art store before, one thing you want to do, a lot of those classes will have a syllabus of the paints they want you to have, and they may add to those paints in the future. Now they may say that they want you to have um, crimson red and ultramarine blue. Well, just picking off any blue off of the shelf, that's one, not a good thing because there is a, when it says ultramarine blue, they mean ultramarine blue. Another thing to keep in mind is when you are taking your classes, pay attention to either the brand that your teacher uses and if the page, your syllabus, doesn't mention a brand of paint, ask your teacher before you go and buy your paints because between the all the painting companies, all the companies that make paint, if you've ever, and it's really shown, <laughs> but a great deal is in the uh, Lowell's and uh, Menards, places like that, you will, if you take two paint chips from two different places and they say that they are the same and you hold them together, those two paint chips are never going to be the same. There's going to be some very subtle or slight differences or major differences. The reason for that is between if it's a hardware store or if it's fine art paint, each company has a patent on that specific color. So for instance, if you're looking at Grumbacher and you need a red, you'll see Grumbacher red. No other paint company other than Grumbacher can make that exact specific shade of red because Grumbacher has a patent on it, more than just Grumbacher having their name. If you get ultramarine blue between Grumbacher or um, Windsor and Newton, those two ultramarine blues, blues are going to be different from each other and they are going to re and if you get start crossing uh, the brands which you know it's not a bad thing but uh, if you start crossing the brands you're going to see that a Windsor Newton crimson red and a Grumbacher ultramarine blue are going to make something completely different than if you had a Windsor Newton red and ultramarine blue or a Grumbacher crimson red and ultramarine blue. And if you start mix matching those, you'll get even more differences and more varieties of colors. Now, the reason I mention this is because of one thing. If you are trying, if you are taking a class where your instructor, you are trying to copy exactly what the instructor is doing, you want your picture to look exactly like they had their picture, the, obviously, the brand that you're using, if you're using a different brand than them, your picture is not going to turn out exactly the same as theirs would. Because if you're using different, different company, that company is going to have a different patent for the number of, uh, for the amount of pigment or the different variety of pigments that are put into making each one of these colors. They're going to have a completely different patent for each color over the company your instructor might be using. Now, if your instructor doesn't care, then have fun, go out, grab what you want, just make sure it's the exact same name. No substitutions, it has to be the same name. Uh, if there's a couple of them out there, you also might wanna get <clears throat> alternate names for some of them. Uh, I've seen uh, people come for uh, Lemon Yellow. Oh, there's only, at the store that I used to work at, there was only one lemon yellow and they didn't know if that was the exact lemon yellow because it looked different than the tube of paint the instructor had. Well, what was the brand? I don't know. Oh, well, sorry, can't help you much there then, can we? So that's just some things to think about when you're going and taking an actual real world class. What kind of uh, paints are your instructor, is your instructor using? What brand is your instructor using? It's got some my kids, my fur kids have been, been laying on this. And another thing to keep in mind, um, you don't want to leave this forever for your paintings. You don't want your, your paper to be taped to something for a year, uh, mostly because, whoop, come here. If you leave it taped for a year, your tape's not going to come off, or at least it's not going to come off nicely. 
going to be mean and devilish. Terrible, terrible. And it's going to rip up your paper as well. As you can see, this tape's coming off really nice and easy. And it'll come off nice and easy for quite some time and not rip my paper or take off layers of my paper. But you'll also end up getting this, where adhesive gets left behind if something's been taped down for too long. Either it will rip the paper, which is what the past one did uh, from here to about here, or it'll leave an adhesive behind, which, you know, I mean, it's not great. It just kind of limits what you can do with your paper. For me, for instance, my tapes now, if I want to use this strip, I use everything. Uh, if I want to use a strip of paper, I got to tape all that off. And that might not leave me enough painting space once I tape all that off. So I might have to narrow down how much gets taped over here if I want a little more surface area. And another thing to keep in mind when you are playing with your paper, I don't care, this is the back side, it can be a little messed up. Uh, some paper will have watermarks, especially if you buy it in the great big sheets, which the 400 pound only comes in great big sheets. And then you cut it up to the size that you want. It can be smaller sheets, it, whatever you want, but it only comes in great big sheets and you buy it by the sheet. Still worth it to me. Maybe for the beginner, you might want to go with the pads. It's, you at least get some playing around with it, but when it comes to the big sheets, uh, it's typically like $20 for one sheet, but it is like monstrously huge. And all of those sheets, and even sometimes some of the really nice um, pads, all end up with a watermark on it. So you can kind of see it with the shading. Uh, that's the watermark for this uh, 140 here. And then the 300 pound press, it also has a watermark too. So just keep in mind those watermarks. You don't want to start a painting on the same side as the watermark and then you get it all done and nice and neat and all of a sudden that watermark is like exemplified and magnified right there for your audience. Your audience knows exactly what sheet of paper you were using and it's right in the middle of your of your foreground and ew. Or even worse, in the middle of your sky. It's nice there, big and blue and ugh, nasty. So that is beginning watercolors. Keep in mind, there are, just a little sum up, there are all kinds of different kinds of papers. Pay attention to the poundage of the paper. Uh, the more poundage you get, the thicker the paper is going to get. The thicker the paper gets, the more I enjoy it particularly. Uh, you might find that you enjoy it as well. So if you're not enjoying the thinner stuff and it just doesn't feel right, at least give one of these sheets a try. It may be $20, but if you find you now love watercolors just because you changed your paper, it's worth it. And again, watercolors come in cakes and tubes. If you prefer cakes and being in complete control of your water, then you can also still buy the tubes. Haha, -ha, tubes. You can still buy these tubes, but just squeeze them off into your cakes as they get used up and then let them dry out. And then you still got a cake again. It's great. Uh, when it comes to your brushes, you're going to want to go for the really nice, fine um, synthetic or synthetic hairs or the really nice and this guy's the synthetic or the really nice sables and camel hair. Anything that's nice and fine and soft and you would almost use it for a makeup brush if you're a gal. Uh, guys, I have no idea what a comparison would be. The little brush when you get, go to get a shave uh, from the, the barber shop, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, that's the kind of brush you want to use. I do find that these guys take a little longer to dry, especially if you got a really thick, monstrous brush. It's like, oh, six days to dry. Okay, well, fine, be that way. So those are just some things to keep in mind. You are going to want some masking tape of some kind to put your, your paper down with. And you're going to want some sort of hard surface on the back. So that way, whenever you're working, if you don't have an easel or you don't have a specific place to necessarily work in your house, then you can pick it up and put it away. 
makes your life so much easier in the long run. Trust me. Well, I hope you all enjoyed my video. Um, Please uh, like, subscribe, let me know what you want to learn how to do in watercolors. Um, I was thinking about maybe doing a how to paint a realistic feather for the next video. Let me know what you want to learn. Let me know what techniques and methods you've heard about. I'm more than happy to demonstrate anything or if I don't know about it, I will research it and demonstrate it. Um, please like and subscribe. It helps my channel out a great deal also lets me know what you like and what you want to learn if you don't really want to comment in the comments section down below. Uh, anything else? Oh yeah, uh, please visit my Facebook page, Naughty Dog Studios. Uh, you'll see the original Naughty Dog there, the only Naughty Dog. The one that was barking. He's very naughty. He's a good boy. He's my baby. You can also visit my Etsy uh, page, also Naughty Dog Studios. And I hope you all have a great day and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!